Welcome to the Real View podcast, where Ohio realtors connect you to innovators and influencers, keeping you with the real view of real estate. Whether you're a broker, agent, first time home buyer, industry leader, or just happen to stumble upon our podcast today, you can expect to hear tips, tools, tricks, interesting information, and so much more from the experts in Ohio's real estate game. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's episode of The Real View Podcast. I'm your host, Allison Wiley. Joining me is my co-host, Carrie Arblaster, and our special guest today, Beth Wanless, who is Ohio Realtors Director of Government Affairs. Hi, Beth. Hi, Carrie. Thank you guys for joining me today. Hello, ladies. I'm giggling because I wish you all could see what I'm looking at, which is Beth doing like fist pumps <laughs> as she's getting ready to present. So it is with that same enthusiasm that she represents Ohio Realtors at the State House, which is fantastic. <laughs> so, Beth, as you may or may not know, every guest we ask this question. The name of the podcast is The Real View, and we always like to hear what our guest's best view has been. So what is the best view that you've ever had? Well, Carrie and Allison, I was on uh, this podcast a few a few weeks ago giving um, kind of a year-end update, and I mistakenly said that the best view I've ever had was on my honeymoon, and then I listened to the first podcast, and the guest said the best view he had ever had was looking at you know his new children at their birth. And I felt, gosh, I am such a scumbag. So I changed my answer to the birth of my three beautiful children, Andrew, Price, and Mary. They're definitely the best view I've ever had. (laughs) And they are so cute. I always love whenever you post pictures of them on Facebook. They are just like the cutest little things. They are adorable. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, that's great. Okay. Well, today we're here to talk with you about the state legislature. A little bit about what we just came through and kind of what we're headed into. So first and foremost, though, I would like to ask you to explain something to our guests. There's this term that we use um, (laughs) at the end of a general assembly after the election has been held. That is lame duck. And I don't know if everybody's familiar with that. So before we start throwing it around, I thought it might be a good idea to have you explain what it means to be in a lame duck session. Sure. Yeah, I did actually just randomly Google this term the other day just to because I, I know what it means, but I was like, where did it come from? Um, and I guess it goes back to the, the mid 18th century in England. But for our purposes here, it really just means the period of time after the election until the end of the session of that General Assembly. So it's just kind of a, a rush to get a lot of stuff done that wasn't done because the year will start over. And then any bill that is left pending and has not been passed by both chambers is dead and has to be reintroduced. So it's sort of this, you know, four or five week long period where we're just rushing around trying to get things done and also keep bad policy from moving forward, of course. Yeah, I was going to say, too, it's an interesting time because not that there's not consequences, But there's a full two years until that next election. And so you've got people who are leaving, people who aren't going to have to discuss what they did for a while. And so it can get a little nuts and sometimes not so good stuff shows up. Yes. Yes. Yep. Okay. It's such a funny term, too. Like the first time I heard that, I'm like, wait, is that a real thing? What what does that even mean? (laughs) So random that it's called that. Yeah, it's it's really means, I guess, like a legislator who's lost re-election or maybe they're term limited for purposes here in Ohio because we do have term limits. So they're kind of like a lame duck, like they can't do much. You know, they're they really just can hang out and hope something they want passes or doesn't pass. So kind of a funny term. But yeah, it is used very widely. So I know you were watching a gazillion things because by the end of a general assembly, there are literally hundreds of bills floating around. So if you could just kind of give us that 30,000 foot view of what were the things that you were trying to pay attention to during this lame duck? Sure. Yeah. I mean, there were, uh, there were a lot of bills, like you mentioned, and we, we really tried to prioritize about two handfuls of them, but I'll go over some some not so juicy bills that we were watching just to make sure some good things happened. House Bill 442, which was really a CPA bill. It was like a certified public accountant reform bill. And it ended up including some occupational licensing changes as well. 
And that was just sun, signed by the governor yesterday on January 7th. So that is done. But all it did was it further extended the home inspector license board or the home inspector board until December 31st of 2024. And that's great news because that means the legislature is committing to this board and the work that it will be doing to license home inspector professionals throughout the state. As many listeners may know, that was um, a huge priority in 2018 to license home inspectors to, to kind of get that consistent standards of practice across the state because so many states do have this license and it's a very important part of the home buying process. Additionally, in that bill, there may have been some realtors who heard about um, some changes to the radon licenses here in Ohio. I think there are three different radon licenses. There's the tester license, mitigation contractor license, and then I think there's like a specialist license. But this, there, the amendment did repeal two of those licenses, which was uh, much to the dismay of the radon professionals and the home inspector professionals who do have those licenses. So we were working with the radon professionals and the home inspector professionals to just better understand how, you know, did they know about this? Like it was definitely kind of a surprise, um, an unfortunate surprise, but the radon, the radon lobbyist who represents the radon professionals was able to get a floor amendment to kind of repeal that repeal and reinstate those licenses, which is quite frankly, very um, impressive to me because it's, you know, slams up. There's a lot of stuff going on. So no changes to the radon licenses. Um, and I know people are very happy about that. They wanted this the status quo. They wanted those licenses to be retained. That's crazy. That is kind of the wild, wild west lame duck stuff <laughs> that you are tasked with paying attention to. It's in, it's out, it's repealed, repealing within a repeal. Yeah, that's crazy. Absolutely crazy. It's interesting that you led with licensing because that seems to have been a theme over the oh, last yes. two years and definitely a topic of interest for legislators. Was there anything else that was discussed over the last General Assembly that you had anticipated potentially moving in lame duck? Why, yes, there was, Carrie. So in Ohio, we actually have um, about 650 occupational licenses. and. There are legislators here in Ohio who are concerned with how many licenses we have. They think that it's a barrier to the workforce, a barrier to employment, and they really just want to make sure that people can get to work here in Ohio, that if they do move into the state, that they can find gainful employment and don't have to you know, jump through too many hoops to have a license for a profession that may not necessarily need a license. Of course, I would never speak to another profession needing a license except for the real estate license, of course, which is licensed in all 50 states and it always should be. There was a bill that was introduced at the beginning of 2020 by Senators uh, McCauley and Rogner. And Senator McCauley is actually on Senate leadership this year. So it's very exciting. He's been really fun to work with and very engaged and responsive to some of the changes that we asked for on his Senate Bill 246. But essentially... It's an 800 page bill. So obviously I'm not going to go too far in depth, but essentially the bill would expedite the licensing process for out of state licensees. So if you say you want an Ohio license and you have been licensed in whatever occupation it is for one year and are in good standing and you pass the criminal background check, you get your license here. That might be great for some license that might be appropriate for some license, but we, we had a lot of problems with this bill and we took our concerns to legislators um, and also to the, the speaker and the Senate president. And we just said, look, you know, this, this is a well-intentioned bill. However, there do need to be guardrails up to make sure whatever applicants want to get their license here in Ohio, that they are competent and they understand Ohio rules and laws and that they have had time to show that they are, you know, in good standing. So we, we did get a lot of pretty positive changes in that bill. And that's, again, Senate Bill 246. And we thought it was a pretty good bill. Like we we made sure that the licenses, well, for me back up, for example, in Indiana, they have brokers only licenses. I think it's like a broker and then a managing broker. Here we have salesperson and broker. So if you're coming from Indiana and you have a broker's license, are you gonna get a broker's license here, even though it's really a salesperson's license? 
So we were able to um, get some language changes in that bill to ensure that, you know, it's a significantly similar license that you're applying for. And that that was good. And um, the licensing authority has a lot more discretion in the final bill. So we felt pretty good about it. But much to our dismay, <laughs> the bill died in lame duck. We were like, I was 99% sure, along with many other lobbyists, that this would move, and it didn't. So um, Senator McCauley did say that he's going to reintroduce it, uh, along with, I believe, Senator Rogner, and they're going to, of course, get it through this GA. And I think we're totally fine with that. They were very responsive to some of our, our concerns, and we think the bill is probably ready for prime time. So, Yeah, that's a great example of how you can do so much work on a bill over the course of two years <laughs> and then like, oh, okay, I guess we'll try again. <laughs> so, yeah. But then, yeah. Like, <laughs> we all were like so like mentally drained from this bill. I think it had like 10 hearings and we thought, you know, everybody had their hands in it, like 650 professions. And then, you know, here it goes. But at least it's a good product for when they start it all, all over again. So. Okay, so what else? I mean, I've heard, oh. I mean, there's so much. Oh, yeah. So we've done licensing, we've done radon, we've done home inspectors. Yeah. Um, what else were you paying attention to? And almost too, Beth, before we get into that, I think it would be good to tell people who may not be familiar or any of our listeners out there what you do. I mean, obviously, from hearing you talk, you know, you, you work a lot at the state house and paying attention to all of these bills and things going on there and working with our legislators. Tell us a little bit about what you do, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis during a lame duck time and then <laughs> not during a lame duck time. Yeah. <laughs> That's a really good question. So I think people hear the term lobbyist and they're like, Oh, what a dirt bag. You know, they, they just are these bad people that do bad things. That's not true at all. We just represent the collective interests of a certain group or party. I mean, the Cancer Society has lobbyists, teachers have lobbyists, the Heart Association has lobbyists. So my job is really just to understand how legislation, if it's either introduced or just a concept, how it impacts Ohio realtors and property owners. And we do that because, well, we do that by um, going to our, our committee members in the Legislative Steering Committee we say, hey, what do you guys think about this? And sometimes I think I know where they're going to go. And then I'm completely, you know, caught off guard because like, oh, we like that or, you know, oh, we hate that. So I get all of my direction from Ohio Realtors through that committee. And then again, I just collectively represent their interests at the state house. So I really just read bills. And then if I can't understand a bill, I send it to Peg and Lori, who are excellent resources. And they help me understand it and how it would impact our membership, maybe give me some history from before my time. And then I just start talking to legislators and, you know, I just, it's my job to be a friendly face to them and know that I'm there to help them understand things. I'm not there to boss them around or tell them what to do, but it's, it's more of just like a here, how's your bill going to impact, you know, 35,000 realtors or millions of homeowners or renters or whatever it is. So I go over, well, not over anymore, I'd call them <laughs> or Zoom and just talk about legislation and help them understand how something may impact our membership or um, Ohioans across the board. So yeah, it's, it's a lot of grunt work, like listening to committee hearings and reading bills and finding data and statistics, but it's really enjoyable and it's really fun. So I love my job. I don't know if I've said that before on this podcast, but I love my job. <laughs> And I'm sure you are so anxious for COVID to be over with and you can get back into the state house and do more fun things than just, you know, being on Zoom all the time. Yeah, I, I love being around people. So um, I think a lot of lobbyists do. And this is just not ideal at all, <laughs> but it's working. So right, for sure. This episode of The Real View is brought to you by the Ohio Association of Community Colleges. Ohio's network of community colleges provides accessible training that accommodates the busy lifestyles of aspiring real estate professionals at half the price of a traditional university. With convenient locations in every part of the state, as well as online options, Ohio's community colleges are your smart choice for pre-licensing education. For more details or to start the journey to a real estate career, 
visit the education page at ohiorealtors.org and then click on the pre-licensed course locations. I wanted to ask you about the commercial stuff. You know, yes. you've done a couple updates since the legislature went home for the end of the year. And in those, you've talked a lot about the activity kind of in the commercial space. And I think yes. that's important for people to hear. Yeah, we we had so many good commercial bills, commercial real estate bills that were moving in 133rd General Assembly. And that went from 2019 to the end of 2020. And I was just getting so excited and, you know, like, yes, we're going to get all these great things moving and it's going to be so good for our commercial members. And unfortunately, some of them just didn't move. I'll start off with the positive note that one of our priority bills, which was Senate Bill 39, which can, included the commercial broker lien language changes. So it would just mean that if a commercial real estate broker files a lien dispute against someone and they win, they get their attorney's fees paid for. And that has been a huge problem for so many of our commercial members. And, you know, I'll say this publicly, I don't always get super, you know, geeked out or passionate about every bill I lobby, but this is one I really believed in. And I felt like it was just, you know, it was just so unfair. And I hate to use that word because it's a very loaded word, but it was just so unfair. And our hardworking members were not getting the commissions that they were owed. And I was so happy to get this, this language changed. And the legislature was very supportive of it. And they understood how important it was. And the governor just signed that bill, Senate Bill 39, which contained our commercial broker lien changes about a week and a half ago. So it will go into effect in about 85 days, which is awesome. And I'm super happy to get that done. But there were a couple of bills in addition to Senate Bill 39 that just did not make it past the finish line, much to my shock and disappointment. House Bill 38, and I'll mention that these bills were not just focused on these commercial provisions. They were like Christmas tree bills, which just means like you have a tree and then all of a sudden all these ornaments or AKA amendments are put onto it. And then you have this big, beautiful Christmas tree with all kinds of crap all over it. And that's what all these bills are, but they had contained provisions that we love. That's a great description. I think you, should, you got to put that on a PowerPoint slide at some point. Yeah, there's like tinsel and like popcorn strands and all kinds of stuff. You know? Maybe great. I'll call this podcast the the tinsel Christmas tree update instead of the lame duck update. I think that's that's way more exciting than just calling it a lame duck lame duck <laughs> update. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So House Bill 38 included language that would have allowed a property owner to present evidence of economic injury due to COVID. So the stay-at-home orders, of course, impacted some businesses. You know, bars obviously are not making a lot of money because um, the curfew and just people are staying home like they should be doing. They're staying home, they're wearing masks, they're not going out and about like we did, you know, before COVID was a thing. So businesses are just not getting income and they're not, they're not getting revenue. So this would just be hugely helpful for many business owners and property owners to try to get another another contest on their property taxes or you know file a complaint on their property taxes to get them possibly reduced it's not it's not a guarantee it just gives you another bite at the apple if you've already contested property taxes but also this would give you the ability to contest for covid cuz you really can't covid really isn't like a thing that you can contest your property taxes for it's really a gray area so this would have been great. And we got a lot of support. There was a great coalition that was created by a lobbying firm who represented a few clients who would have liked this. Senate Bill 95 contained language that would have allowed commercial and industrial tenants who pay all property taxes. And then also they would need the authority of the property owner or landlord, and they would be able to contest property values on behalf of the property owner. So right now you cannot do that, which is kind of crazy. If you pay all the property taxes, you should be able to do that. Um, this would just give a lot of flexibility to tenants to contest in a timely manner because there is that very short window. And then of course, my personal favorite is House Bill 75. And I don't know if listeners know this, but in the state of Ohio, someone can contest your property taxes. A lot of states do not allow that. And if they do have something similar, there are a lot of guardrails in place. So you have to satisfy certain requirements before you can do it. So, you know, a lot of a lot of school boards will contest property taxes on mainly commercial properties, but also residential properties. 
And the property owner has no idea that someone is contesting their property value for tax purposes. So all this bill would have done was require a political subdivision, so a school board, to pass a resolution saying that they're going to contest property values. Pretty simple, nothing crazy. And then also the political subdivision would have had to notify the property owner of the complaint. And, you know, I was actually just asking my mom, just, you know, I kind of like ask her stuff to see what she thinks. And just as like a, you know, an average Joe homeowner. And I was like, mom, would you know where to go to see if someone's contesting your property values? And she's like, wait, what? I don't even know what you're talking about. And I'm like, ah, oh, this is crazy. So, you know, House Bill 75 would have put, it would not, you can still contest another person's property values. It just would have said that you have to pass these steps in order to do that. And then the, the property owner should be notified at the very least. They need to know what's going on with their private property. And I looked in Representative Marin's sponsor testimony. He was the, the person who introduced this bill. And he said that the practice here in Ohio has become so abusive that the Council of State Taxation or COST, representing over 500 national corporations, has publicly downgraded Ohio business climate specifically due to this policy. So it is something, and our members have been telling us this is this is bad policy. We need we need some reform here. The bill was watered down like a tiny little bit, but it was still a great version. They basically just said that commercial members would not have to be notified, and residential property owners would be notified. So it's still a great bill. And I was actually preparing for this call, and Representative Jason Stevens called, and he's actually a former county auditor. So you know, he knows property taxes, he knows property valuation. And he was saying, you know, this is something that we're going to look at this year because it is important. This is an important policy. And he actually mentioned all three of these bills that I'm talking about now. So House Bill 38, Senate Bill 95, and House Bill 75, and all of the great commercial real estate policy that's in them. And he said he liked them, he voted for them, and he wanted to reintroduce, you know, some versions of them in the next couple of weeks. So the bills all did fail, unfortunately. It was just a product of lame duck. You know, it's unfortunate. You know, one chamber was holding up one bill and they wouldn't pass that bill until the other chamber passed their bill. Unfortunately, we ran out of time and it was it was very disappointing. I didn't say this, but I was really hoping to like take vacation time and eat and drink my way through the holidays. But unfortunately, I was like calling legislators on December 23rd, bugging them, and they were so nice. God bless them. But we just didn't get this done. And there were a lot of us interested in this. It wasn't just the realtors. But I'm looking forward to the year. I think it's it's going to be it's going to be a good year. And I'm so happy to hear that there are legislators out there who are committed to moving these really good commercial real estate bills. So. Yeah. And on that note, give us a little breakdown of what we can expect this year. Ooh, well, I have no idea. <laughs> Just kidding. Well, I wanted to mention this and I think the podcast is going to come out like right on the same day. But on January 19th, in conjunction with the Winter Conference, we're going to be hosting a local government forum. And we're going to have former tax commissioner Tom Zeno on and he's going to talk to us about property taxes and reappraisals and what's going on. Because as many listeners know, home prices are on fire right now. And the auditors are, you know, they're doing their reappraisals and you're seeing appraisal numbers as high as 15 to 20% increases. So we just wanted to make sure that we understood what was going on, that our members know what's going on. And so he's going to come on um, a Zoom just talk to us about it. So I would invite everybody to join in. It's going to be a very fascinating conversation because you'll be able to ask all sorts of questions and learn all about the wild world of property taxation. <laughs> it's a very, <laughs> very juicy topic. <laughs> That's awesome. How can people sign up for it? Is there a way they just go to our website or... Yeah, it's going to be a part of the winter conference. So if they do participate in that, they'll be able to have access to it. And that'll be, all, of course, all online. And it's going to be very casual, nothing formal, and it's going to be more conversational to kind of answer questions that our members have. Maybe they have a client who has a question. Come on and ask the former state tax commissioner. It's going to be a cool opportunity. 
Definitely. Yeah. Everybody get signed up for that. OhioRealtors.org. You'll find out all that information on there. Yes. Other than that, the respective chambers have their retreats to discuss priority issues. So the House Republicans are going to be having a retreat to talk about policy issues. And I did talk about some things that we'd like to see done with Representative Stevens and then the majority floor leader, which is Bill Seitz. We kind of talked about that and they're going to be going over things. School funding reform is going to be a hot topic in this year because it will be done with the budget that's coming up as well. Legislative committees will then get their new leadership assignments. And that means just like the chair and vice chair will be announced. So that's always exciting too. You're always hoping it's, you know, someone that's easy to work with or you have a good relationship with. So I'll be crossing my fingers for that. And then there are 19 new members in the Ohio House. And then I think there are two new senators. So I'll be reaching out to introduce myself and let them know what's important to Ohio Realtors. And then, like I said, it's a budget year. So we're already working with the governor and lieutenant governor to get a few goodies in the executive budget and just trying to stay on top of some things and see what we can get done. And hopefully, if there is anything that we don't like, we can ward it off and keep it away. So busy year for sure. For sure. Lots of good stuff happening. And I'm sure, um, you know, we'll have you on again. I'm looking forward to, you know, you being a regular guest on our podcast to give us these legislative updates, you know, as they come in. So they're always super informative and super helpful. So thanks for joining us today, Beth. This was super helpful for our lame duck Christmas tree update. (laughs) We have to do like a mutt. You can see us on one of these because this is just great. I was just going to say, as Carrie mentioned earlier, Beth is on our camera like, yeah, you guys got it. (laughs) So that's what we're laughing at right now. I know all you of you listening cannot see this, but that is why we are giggling. So on that note, we will wrap this episode up. Beth and Carrie, thank you so much for joining me today. And we will see you guys next time. Thank you so much, ladies. Thank you for listening to The Real View. That wraps up today's episode. You can keep up with the latest on the podcast at ohiorealtors.org slash The Real View and on Apple or Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Have questions, comments, or suggestions? We want to hear from you. Email us at podcast at ohiorealtors.org. We'll see you next time. This has been a Humble Pod production. Stay humble.